Before we jump into this week's video, here's our third update on our backpack uh, program. Last year, we had uh, funded 30 backpacks uh, at a cost of 250. Uh, we spent 7,500. This year, our target is a minimum of 40. We're raising the cost of what we spend to 300 for 12,000. So we want to raise at least $4,500. We're not asking you for the 45. Uh, we're just asking you to do things that make me pay another 45. Uh, so every time you click like on one of the um, four videos that was from July 17th, July 24th, July 31st, and the one you're watching now, every time you click like, for every like, I donate a dollar. For every subscriber during these particular videos, I donate a dollar. And all revenue uh, from these videos, I donate as well. So July 17th has accumulated $1,620.07. That is from likes, subscribers, and all the revenue on that particular video. July 24th, 1449, and July 31st, 1282. Well, this one's been up since the 17th, right? This one's been up since the 31st. It only had one week. Once you get to a certain point, it generates revenue, and then it sort of just goes sideways. So we, I don't expect much more to happen uh, to uh, the first video, but uh, a couple more hundred, I think, collectively for these two. 43.49 so far, looking for 45 to get to a minimum of 12. That's just a minimum. If uh, next week follows suit, I think we can end somewhere around 6,000 because next week should generate around the same 1300 plus a couple hundred more out of these 6000 the target was 1500 that's sorry 45 that's 1500 more uh, and since we're spending 300 uh, per backpack that means we can bring this to 45 that is 45 kids going back to school uh, with the equivalent of what their peers have so that there is no deficit in what they have uh, when they head back that these are kids that otherwise wouldn't have had it um, so they're they're at a disadvantage uh, both psychologically because they can see what other people have and they may not show it many of them may conceal it but they feel it I know what that feels like um, so I think that's uh, that's you know going from 30 to 45 we're doing well I'd like to see in four or five years time we're doing 150 to 200 of these a year if you want to donate uh, uh, directly uh, to uh, what we're doing, don't use the YouTube um, button where you can donate right on my channel. YouTube takes 30% of all that. Look in the description box. The first link in the description box is the link to Big Brothers Big Sisters Niagara. Uh, any donation you make there, they get 100% of the proceeds. Uh, YouTube takes 30% when you donate on my channel. Uh, let's bypass that and go right to Big Brothers Big Sisters. But there we are so far, 43, 49. You can basically say we've hit our target. Next week will put us above our target. So if you have not already done so, go back to these three videos and click like. If you click like here, 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 and on this one, uh, that's an extra $4. And if you're not subscribed, well, you can only subscribe once. Uh, you can, if this, if you um, not click like at all or subscribe, you can donate $5 through your actions. It doesn't cost you 5 bucks. It's costing me 5 bucks. Just go back on these, click on like, subscribe uh, while you're watching at least one of those four. Uh, and then if you are watching them, you let them run. Uh, the ad revenue will, uh, will pick up as well. And uh, maybe, maybe we can get to 6,300. And move this to 46. Maybe we can get to 6,600, right? And move this to 47. Uh, but we have until next Sunday at noon to generate statistics for this. All right, let's, uh, let's get right to it this week. Well, last week, there were six Fed officials that were speaking, pushing back on what was uh, a pretty uh, unproductive press conference by Powell which uh, for three days, four days after that, all the way to Monday, had moved rates in the wrong direction. At one point, the 30-year mortgage was down to 5.05%, down from over 6%. Uh, that is rates moving in the wrong direction. So they came out and they pushed back uh, quite hard against that. So let's see where we ended the week. 
We ended the week on Friday, and I think the uh, most powerful statement came on Saturday. And we'll see what these statements are as far as what to expect for rates that if uh, you could have, if there was trading on Saturday uh, for this, I think that uh, rates would have been, uh, would have increased much more across the board. So I look for Monday uh, to be a big increase in yields. Let's have a look at the money market rates all the way out to the one year. They all increased uh, with the two month, the six month, and the one year hitting uh, their highs for the year. If we look at capital market rates, none of them hit the high for the year. The big question still remains, have we seen uh, the highs for the 10 year? We're at 283, the high for the year was 3.49. Uh, have we seen the highs of the year? We do have an inverted curve so the question uh, becomes, well, how does an inversion uh, fix itself? Because usually the curve inverts ahead of a recession and then reverts back to upward sloping before the recession actually happens. So how does that resolve itself? Does it resolve itself with the two-year dropping in anticipation of the recession? Or does it resolve itself uh, with the 10-year rising uh, because it's been inverted for so long, it's not paying money being inverted, the market uh, just sort of trades it up. So we'll see on the next screen how that has been resolved in the last two recessions. But we are now 31 days uh, in reversion, negative 41 basis points. This is deeper uh, than the uh, inversion before 2000, uh, 2008, 2009. The inversion before the dot-com crash was 43 basis points. Uh, but it was inverted for uh, much longer than 31 days, but it hit a maximum of negative uh, 43. We're at negative 41 right now and 31 days and counting. The fives to tens are inverted as well. And uh, for the three month to the 10 year, which is an important one the Fed looks at as well, as positive 25 basis points, it uh, ticked down uh, one basis point. Balance sheet is moving in the right direction. Uh, down um, for the week ending August 4th over the previous week, it's down another 16.17 billion. This is all U.S. Treasuries. I looked at uh, how many more uh, MBS or how much more MBS needs to be bought based on how much they bought in the to be announced market, uh, in the forward market. And there still are going to be settlements this month and into September. So we can't expect too much uh, reduction in the size of MBS because they've already committed to certain purchases and settlements go all the way into September. So um, any decline in the balance sheet is going to come purely from treasuries. But we're down another 16.17 billion. Uh, while I'm on this, uh, let me describe to you um, what it means when we say uh, the uh, the federal government will inflate away the debt because I, I, um, I've heard that expression a few times that the, uh, the government is not too anxious to get rid of inflation because it allows them to inflate away the debt. Uh, that is only if they do a very particular thing. So let's say that uh, incomes are 100 this year and income tax is 30%. They're going to raise $30 uh, in income tax based on these incomes. But if wage inflation is running hot, and that's what's fueling inflation, if rage, wage inflation is running hot, and this year uh, wages are going to be 107, um, well, when you uh, are taxing at 30%, you're now going to get uh, 3210. So you have more tax revenue without raising taxes. That's beautiful. You inflate away the debt if you take the extra 210 and you pay down existing debt. That's called inflating away the debt because you inflate wages by the rate of inflation. And since the tax rate is any increase in what they're getting, they're being taxed on at their marginal tax rate. If you then take that excess revenue, which you didn't account for and you didn't plan for, you take the inflated tax revenue and pay down the debt. Yes, that's called inflating away the debt. If you do not pay down any debt while this is happening, all you're doing is rolling over existing debt at higher and higher interest rates. You're actually inflating the debt. 
So it uh, will be interesting to see over the uh, next little while what the size of the federal debt is and if they are actually taking this advantage to inflate away the debt or are they completely wasting this crisis. That's the expression, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, if they do take advantage of this, this actually does have a benefit in that you come out the other side with lower debt if you allow inflation to do that for you. And here you have to rely on, uh, on governments not to say, hey, we have more money, let's spend more money. You actually have to take that extra revenue and pay down debt. All right, so we're down $16.17 billion. Fed funds futures for October. Uh, as of Friday, 96.98. That's an index level, which means it's implying 3.02 on the Fed funds rate. Uh, minus the midpoint over 75 basis points, 86% probability of a 75 point uh, rate hike. Last week, that was 71.3%. So the probability of 75 basis points uh, over the week has increased 15%. And that's primarily due to the Fed speak but we're still missing uh, the Saturday uh, statement, which was pretty hawkish. So I expect Monday that probability to increase. If we go to January, we're getting a 9644, which implies 3.56 on the Fed funds rate. If you uh, divide that by 125, take the midpoint, divide by 125, there's a 94.8% probability right now, or the market is pricing in basically 95% probability of 125 basis points. The expectation was for 100. Uh, last week, we had a 93.5% probability for 100. We're now at 94.8 for 125. Uh, last week for 125 was 74.8. So that has jumped 20% uh, over December. And the thinking was um, the Fed will go 50 in September, followed by two, uh, two moves of 25. And I said, I see 75, followed by two moves of 50. So this was 100, uh, mine was 175. We're now pricing in 125. We're getting closer to the 175. I think that is still too low. Uh, we'll see uh, what the uh, Fed governors and the uh, uh, Fed speakers had to say. Well, there was one governor and two uh, um, uh, Federal Reserve presidents. Um, OAS, all of them uh, decreased. All of them decreased across the board except for the uh, double A's. Uh, they have very, very low volatility. Uh, but investment grade uh, spreads 154 down to 150. High yield 498 down to 455. Uh, high yield contracts a lot. High yield is a lot more uh, volatile than investment grade. And if we go down into the lower credit quality for uh, double B's, uh, spreads uh, decreased 9.15%. Even on triple C's, look where, uh, where we are here, 10.38 uh, uh, decreased by 7.82%. So on uh, double B's, under 300 basis points, 2.98. August 18th, we get the minutes from the last Fed meeting. And we will see uh, the language they used for inflation. If we look at the last several uh, minutes that we've gone through, and you can go back and uh, read them, uh, pay attention to the language that they use for inflation. They make it uh, appear uh, in uh, what they say that they have a singular laser-like focus on inflation, and they are absolutely drop-dead serious about getting that down which was completely at odds with Powell's PEST press conference when he said, we're near the neutral rate. We're going to look at that today, how close to the neutral rate we are. And if we are close to the neutral rate, what does he think the neutral rate is? Uh, we're close to the neutral rate. We think that uh, we'll begin to start slowing down uh, uh, soon. And uh, this stuff really doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> what a terrible press conference. I'll tell you something, though. If you're a producer, this is a ratings bonanza because people uh, don't want to see perfection. They want to see a train wreck. That's why we have Shark Week. Goldfish Week? That won't sell. You need Shark Week. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if in September uh, it is one of the most highly rated press conferences in terms of ratings. Uh, as far as revenue goes, they should uh, start to sell advertising. 
So on the podium, you can see, you know, Allstate Insurance, uh, you know, disaster insurance. Uh, come see us for all your disaster insurance needs because, well, it is a train wreck of a press conference to begin with. You may as well generate some revenue from it. Next uh, FOMC meeting, September 21st. Okay, let's uh, just look at the uh, uh, back at the last two uh, recessions and see how the yield curve uh, inversion uh, fixed itself. We had uh, a yield curve inversion from February 2000 to December 2000. It hit a maximum of 47 basis points. I think on the previous screen I said 43. Uh, my bad. 47 basis points. We're sitting at 41 right now. But you can see that it was inverted uh, for um, a good 10 months. Uh, the two-year peaked in May 2000 at 6.69, and the first rate cut was in December of 2000. By that time, the two-year was down to 5.11. The 10-year uh, was at 5.12. So we can see uh, the two-year here is in red. You can see the two-year peaking over here, and there's the 10-year. So there's your inversion right there. And look at the two-year dropping. Here is the Fed funds rate. It was uh, constant up to this point, and then there was just a big drop. But the two-year was dropping well in advance of the drop uh, from the central bank. If we look over at this point, there's the red line. There is your peak in the two-year. And you had a couple of inversions going on here. The first inversion was December 05 to February 06. It only got to 14 basis points. Then it uh, uh, went up. The curve was upward sloping until August of 06 to February of 07. The maximum inversion there was 16 basis points. The two-year peaked in June of 2006 at 5.16. The first cut was August of 07. The two-year was down to 4.15 uh, by the time uh, the first cut happened. Here's the uh, period of time over which the Fed funds rate was constant. There's your first cut. The two-year was already uh, decreasing ahead of that. So how does an inverted yield curve fix itself, the two-year anticipates the rate cut. Not the 10-year, but the two-year begins to anticipate the rate cut. And a while back, I had done a regression about how well the two-year predicts the, um, the federal funds rate, and we had done a certain number of lags. So you may want to go back and have a look at that video. The two-year does anticipate where the federal funds rate will go. So if we have an inverted yield curve from the twos to the tens, there is the two, there is the ten, it usually fixes itself by the two-year anticipating the rate cut uh, to get your upward sloping curve. Well, maybe it looks more like that because the front end would still uh, reflect uh, the federal funds rate, especially at the one month and the two month, but the two year uh, would then be below the 10 year by the two year anticipating. So if we uh, want to keep our eye on where the market thinks the Fed funds rate will go, uh, the two year is the one to watch. Okay, so here are our real rates. Shouldn't be surprising, all real rates did increase. We are no longer negative on real rates. By the way, on Monday, uh, be, the first uh, Fed speakers didn't happen until Tuesday. On Monday, this got even more negative, and the seven-year went negative as well. Uh, also, the 30-year fixed went down to 5.05% by the end of Monday day and uh, gained 40 points, into 45 into the end of the week. 36 just in one day, that is just... This 36 came right off the uh, employment report. In fact, most of the big moves, if you look at uh, the day-over-day -day, uh, change in rates, came on Friday on that, uh, on that payroll report. So all uh, real yields are higher. Um, all break-evens went lower. Your nominals went higher. Your break-evens, uh, your real rates went higher, which pushed your uh, break-even rates lower. Again, on mortgage rates, sitting at 5.45 on a 30 versus 6.11 on June 13th. So you still have easier financial conditions today than you did on June 14th. Same with all your capital market rates. They are lower today than they were on June 13th. So over the last 60 days, financial conditions in the capital markets and the mortgage markets have eased. That is not what the Fed wants, but they have eased. And uh, whenever financial markets go up as well, asset markets go up, that is financial conditions easing as well because you have a wealth effect on that. Consumers feel uh, that things are getting better and they're more willing to spend more. This is all going in the wrong direction. 
Uh, as of Monday, it looked pretty bad. Uh, what happened during the course of the week was a lot of heavy lifting uh, from Fed speakers just to repair the damage done from the press conference. You're still not back to where mon mon monetary policy wanted these things to be. So you still have a lot of job owning to do just, just to get the policy into the rates. Um, mortgage applications, that's not surprising because uh, you do have uh, easing mortgage conditions up 1.2%. Uh, this does not incorporate the really low rates that we had last week and into Monday. So I expect next week when we see mortgage applications, I think they'll jump even more than 1.2%. Refis were up 1.46, purchases up 0.97. From Realtor.com, here we are, week ending July 30th. These are all year-over-year -year changes. We're now uh, Prices are now 15.6% higher as of July 30th than last year. The week before they were 16.6, same with the week before, but here 14.7 year to date. It's 15.6 year over year. Just for, the, just for that particular week, going in the right direction, it was 16.6, heading now down to 15.6. Active listings still up 30% year over year. That's unchanged from the week before, but uh, it is up. It's still down for the year though. It's still a year to date lower, but week by week, you're looking for the change in the change. This is going in the right direction. And this certainly is going in the right direction as well. Uh, one day faster, zero days faster, now one day slower. That means that houses are staying on the market a day longer um, based on the week ending July 30th than it did last year at this time. So they're taking longer to sell, but only uh, one day longer. Still though, um, you have significant double digit uh, price gains. Uh, the next week we should see the report for the whole month of July. Uh, which gives us a lot more information. So that, uh, that's something to look forward to. Not a lot of housing data this week. We had mortgage apps and, and that's about it. So not much to go on. But one thing we know is mortgage rates last week uh, going into the close on Monday were down to 5.05. .05. The FHA mortgages uh, were, even, were even lower. So it, uh, uh, it just would not be surprising to see a bunch of buyers uh, and mortgage holders take advantage of that. And I, I'd expect the purchase index next week to show that there was an increase over that week and the refi index to show there was an increase. Two things the Fed did not want to happen. So um, hopefully, hopefully that'll be corrected in the weeks coming up, especially uh, with the Fed talk last week. Okay, getting to the education part of the video for the week. Every week I try to put something new in uh, that uh, you know uh, gives you some insight into something that we haven't seen before. Here we're going to dive into the Taylor Rule, and there is uh, there was discussion last week after uh, Fed's uh, the Fed's uh, um, press conference. Powell, I shouldn't call it the Fed's because I don't think it was reflective of the committee. It was Powell's press conference and his unscripted remark about being near the neutral rate. Well, if we're near the neutral rate, uh, we can use the Taylor rule to figure out what he thinks the neutral rate is. And we can use current data and we can use the Fed's own projections because every second central bank meeting, they provide a summary of economic projections. The next update is September 21st, which is 45 days away. But this is the last set of projections that we had for 2002 to, uh, sorry, 2022, 2023, 2024, and what the longer run targets happen to be for real GDP 1.8 for uh, PCE 2. Notice that they have PCE inflation up here and they have core PCE inflation. And when they say that their long run target is 2%, they mean headline. So we're going to use the headline numbers in our inflation expectations. But we have everything here that we need uh, to calculate uh, what the neutral rate would be. So this is saying that the nominal policy rate, this is the Fed's uh, uh, overnight rate. We know right now it's at 2.5. We can observe that. We'll use the upper bound. You really should be using the middle of the range, but we'll give them a little bit of credit. We'll give them a little bit of leeway. It's kind of like spotting them a few points before we begin the game. We'll, we'll go to 250. How's that sound? 
This is the real, um, the real neutral rate. This is an inflation expectation. So this would be the nominal neutral rate, the nominal policy rate, the nominal neutral rate. This is the output gap. So this is uh, what the GDP forecast would be. This is what trend is. This is the output gap. If this is negative, uh, you have a negative output gap. Uh, this would suggest, uh, because you're multiplying it, this is, uh, sorry, adding uh, a 0.5 times a negative amount would subtract. So if you have an output gap and you're below potential, it should speak to a lower policy rate. This is an inflation gap over here. So if expectations are higher than the target, since this is an addition and this is multiplying a positive with a positive, it should increase the policy rate. Uh, if the forecast were at trend, this term would be zero. If inflation uh, expectations were at target, this would be zero. Then the nominal policy rate should equal the nominal neutral rate. With that in mind, Let's begin. Where are we going to get our inflation expectation? Well, for uh, the current, uh, we'll just look at where PCE happens to be, the June PCE. For a GDP forecast, the best forecast is the last quarter annualized, which was negative 0.9%. Uh, what is the trend? They're telling us 1.8, so we'll use the 1.8. Again, our inflation expectation was 6.8. What is our target? They're telling us over here it's 2. We'll put in 2. Our star right now is negative 5.35 or negative 535 basis points. Does that sound to you like we're at a neutral rate? Uh, having a uh, real neutral rate of negative 535 basis points. I don't think anybody would say yes. I think we would say no. However, uh, monetary policy works with a lag. You can't really, or at least the argument, the pushback to using this would be, you can't look at today's uh, real neutral rate. Because monetary policy works with the lag, you have to look 12 months to 18 months in advance. So let's do that. We'll do the 2022 year end, the 2023 year end, and the 2024 year end. And here's what we want to solve for, R star. So where do we get our policy rates? Well, they're telling us what it is, what it's going to be. The uh, federal funds rate uh, is right here, 3.4 to 3.8 to 3.4 for 22, 23, and 24. So there's where we get 3, 4, 3, 8, and 3, 4. In March, it was 1.9. Uh, this, uh, uh, when they uh, released the next uh, update, they brought to 3.4. It's going to be interesting when we look at September 21, what is it going to be in light of where all these um, R star rates happen to be and how we are so far negative right now? Even by the end of the year, we're still going to be negative. So there's where we get um, the policy rates. They're giving us uh, the projected path of the policy rate. Uh, where's the 5.2, the 2.6, and the 2.2 coming in? That's uh, inflation expectations. And since we know that they're using headline, there's your 5.2, your 2.6, and your 2.2. The numbers below were what March used to be. In March, when they released the summary of economic projections, this is what they thought. Uh, the May one, they've increased, I think this was May, or early June, sorry, early June uh, increased to that. And then September, we'll see what it's going to be. So there's the 5.2, 2.6, and 2.2 which also uh, sits in this term over here. We know the uh, long term is 2%, so there's our 2% uh, over here. We know that our trend GDP is 1.8 uh, long run, so we'll put 1.8 in each of these, and our projection is 1717 and 19. So there's where we get the 1717 and 19. Well, all of these are constants, solve for R star uh, by the end of the year, given uh, a target of 3.4, given their own, I'm using, I'm using nothing but their own projections. They're projecting that the neutral, the real neutral rate by the end of the year will be negative 335 basis points. Why then would you say in a press conference, you think you're close to the neutral rate? Do you really, you know, you have to pull them aside and say, do you really believe the real neutral rate is negative 335 basis points? You can't be serious. 
he may say, well, yeah, not this year. Sorry. It works uh, with a lag of a year and a half. You got to go out to the end of 2023. Okay, well, R star is negative. Uh, sorry, R star is 95 basis points. Well, okay. Yeah, that you could start to say, well, okay. There is some belief that R star is 250 basis points, but 95, all right. When you get out to 2024, it's at 105 basis points. Now, you only get there if these projections are right. 2.6 by the end of next year. We'll see in September what that is. If it's anything higher than 2.6, you're not going to have this R star. You're going to have a lower R star, which means the only way to get R star higher is to increase your policy rate. Because this, if this is higher than 2.6, not only will you have this increase in uh, added to the real neutral rate, you'll also have it added to the inflation gap as well. Uh, and the higher inflation is, it's going to be harder to get real GDP up. You can get real GDP up by getting inflation down because if everybody spends every penny they make and inflation comes down, they'll just buy more stuff. More stuff means more real things happen. You can get real GDP up by getting inflation down. That's a pathway. Uh, that's a pathway out. But you got to get inflation down uh, while activity is increasing at the same time. But isn't that the cause of inflation? You see the conundrum that is there. That there is no there is no pathway that way. The only pathway is to actually decrease the amount of aggregate money that gets spent, which means you have to decrease incomes. You have to decrease employment. This jobs report, wrong way. The rates that uh, happened after the press conference, wrong way. Nothing went the right way for the Fed last week. So there's our idea of where we are on the neutral rate. If we take our current situation, we're currently sitting at a real neutral rate of negative 535 basis points. If we take nothing but the Fed's own projections, this is their stuff. It's not even me talking at this point. It's just them. Uh, end of year forecast for the real uh, neutral rate is negative 335 basis points. I don't think they mean for that to happen. And the only way to fix that is this is not working out for them right now uh, because we're at 6.8. So this is not working out. We'll see CPI this week. We'll see one more PCE. But since they're using PCE here, we have to use PCE as well. That's not working out for them. Um, the GDP readings so far have not been working out for them. You had a negative 1.6 and negative 0.9. And I pointed out that I don't believe those numbers, but those are what they are. Uh, so the only thing that can happen is the nominal policy rate must increase if you want the real neutral rate to increase. Okay, on this screen, let's look at the possibility uh, that uh, the projection of 5.2% can happen. And we already know what has happened to this point of the year. And we know that we're above 5.2. So we can sort of imply what has to happen in the balance of the year to hit that 5.2. There are uh, two ways of looking at inflation. There is forward-looking expectations and there's backwards-looking. When we look at year-over-year -year PCE, it's backwards-looking. Because we have a uh, report at this point in time which tells us about prices over this period of time. And we compare it with that same time period last year, well, that's backward looking. So it's one month uh, this year over the same month last year. When we take the current month that we're in and we look at prices and we compound those prices for the next 12 months, because if prices are up 1% in one month, they'll be up 1% the next month, then 1% the month after that, that's 1.01 to the 12. Well, the last PCE report had headline at 1% for the month, which implies 12.03% PCE uh, uh, price inflation over the next 12 months. Uh, the month before, if we uh, compound it, you're at 7.44. April was down at 2.648. Lots of variability in doing this. So the backwards looking number if we're thinking about, well, what can we expect going forward? It is some function of what we already had plus some drift component. That is a random walk, is that you have 
uh, your best guess for what, uh, let's say, y uh, uh, a t is, is uh, some uh, drift component plus uh, some beta component of a y t minus 1. Some, some function of last period plus some drift component uh, inflation will follow that uh, will follow that trend. So a backwards looking uh, um, measure is what they have been using in their statements when they say inflation at 9.1 percent is much 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 too high. They're making two mistakes there whenever you hear somebody say that. Number one is they're using CPI instead of PCE. And number two, they're using a backwards looking measure as opposed to a forwards looking measure. But let's use the backwards looking measure because whenever I hear them speak, they seem to be using a backwards looking measure. Uh, December 2021, the chain type PCE index was sitting at 118.709. So if we are going to accept 5.2%, to get to 5.2% for 2022, that means December 2022 has to end at 124.8818. Uh, that is the, the uh, last year's December increased by 5.2%. Well, we're already at 123.187. The June uh, number uh, for the index is at 123.187. So that means the index can only increase another 1.3758% over six months or 2.77% annualized. So I want you to ask yourself, is it realistic to expect headline PCE to come in over the next six months at a 2.77% annualized rate when we're sitting at 6.8 right now, 6.75894 on a backwards looking basis or 12.034 on a forward looking basis? Is that suddenly going to happen? If it's not going to happen, this is too low, which means the real uh, neutral rate is significantly lower than 335 basis points. So I've done a little sensitivity analysis down here. I said, well, let's assume that we get the nominal rate to 4% instead of their 3.4. Uh, and inflation comes in at 6%. Right now it's 6. Point, where are we? 6.75. This is backwards looking. Forwards looking is 12.03. But let's go with the 6.75 and bring it down. Uh, not a lot because you have this. Uh, you have such an elevated uh, forward compounded rate. Even if you go to the previous month, you're at 7.44. Bring it down to six. Uh, and I've got GDP coming in for the year at 1.5%, even though for the first uh, half of the year we're running negative. So let's assume that those were anomalies and that will actually outperform at the end of the year. But you still got to make up for the negatives at the beginning of the year. 1.5, there's your 6% in here. That still keeps the real neutral rate at negative 385 basis points. 50 worse than what we had, even though we're at 4%. Let's assume that things go really, really well uh, and the number comes down to 4% by the end of the year. So that by the time we get to December, year over year headline is 4% or 6.75. This does not look like it's moving in the right direction and it's slow moving. You would have to have a big drop off because 4% is way down here, right? So if you draw that across here uh, and go to December, you would have to have a significant drop off. But let's say it gets to 4. If it got to 4%, that means people uh, still would have more spending power. They will buy more things. I put GDP at 2.2%, which means 2.2 minus 1.8 and taking half of that would add 0.2 to the rate. Here's your 4% inside here, 4 minus 2 and half of that is 1. You get to a real neutral rate of 100 and negative 120 basis points by the end of the year. Still hard to believe that a negative rate is neutral. And that's if everything goes right. That's if you get to 4% over here. Let's raise rates to 4%. Inflation does come down to 4%. Magically, GDP jumps to 2.2%. You'd still have negative real policy rate. So I don't think uh, that that is the intention of the FOMC at all. I think the intention is to get the neutral rate to zero, uh, if not higher, which means that even at 4% and even under a perfect scenario, 
we're nowhere near uh, that rate. I don't think you're going to get a perfect scenario, so I don't think you're going to get as good as 120 uh, basis points negative. Uh, you'll be somewhere around negative 300 to negative 400 basis points, even at 4%. So 4% would seem to be the minimum that you'd want to get to by the end of the year. Okay, let's look at uh, what uh, some of the voting members and non-voting members had to say. Uh, Loretta Mester is a voting member. James Bullard is a voting member. Uh, Michelle Bowman is not a president of a um, central bank or one of the Federal Reserve Banks. She is on the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors is made up of seven uh, individuals. Uh, and then you have five members from the regional uh, um, central banks uh, or the regional Federal Reserve Banks that make up the committee so that there is 12. New York is a permanent member. Uh, because they conduct all of the open market uh, operations, the buying and the selling. They do all of that. They're a permanent member. The other four serve one-year terms. So this is a one-year term. This is a one-year term. Uh, Mary Daly is a non-voting member, and she's not even an alternate. But she does have a voice. Let's see what uh, these uh, these people have to say. <clears throat> Letter Mester, greater than 4%. Uh, the... Um, if you look at uh, their their forecast, they went as high as 3.8%. This is the Fed's uh, economic projection, projections, as high as 3.8% uh, uh, in 2023. The federal funds futures aren't, aren't even going as high as 3.8%. She's saying you got to go to 4%. Uh, and they'll be tightening through uh, the first half of 2023. Uh, the federal funds futures has uh, the um, rate peaking in December, kind of staying constant for the first three months and then starting to be cut uh, sometime in the second quarter. And she's saying, no, we're still going to be going upwards in the first half of 2023. Needs several months of inflation declines just to stop raising, not cutting. You need to see several months of declining inflation just to stop raising. We haven't seen that yet. Uh, 75 basis points in September is not unreasonable. Bullard sees another 150 basis points this year. The market is pricing in 125 uh, basis points, roughly with about 95% probability. I think it's 175. He said we need to see 150. The market's not pricing in 150 yet. Um, rates are going to be higher for longer. Inflation must convincingly drop. Michelle Bowman, this was Saturday, uh, one of the more aggressive ones, supports ongoing 75 basis point hikes. Not even a question of 50. We stay at 75 until we see inflation drop, and she has three qualifications in a consistent a meaningful and a lasting way. That doesn't mean one or two reports. That means three or four months of inflation dropping month after month after month in a consistent, meaningful, and not by 0.1 and 0.1 and 0.1. So you go from 6.8 to 6.7 to 6.6. That is not meaningful. She wants it to see a consistent, meaningful, and lasting way. Uh, and she says, I have seen few, if any, indicators of this, which means the job hasn't even begun. Mary Daly, <clears throat> puzzled by the futures suggesting the end is near. The Fed will keep raising rates and hold them there, quote, for a while, quote, nowhere near, done, and quote, a long way to go. That does not sound like uh, we're going to get to 3.4, 3.5 by the end of the year, and then second quarter of 23 start cutting. None of this sounds like it. Evans, Chicago, this is an alternate, not a voting member, but an alternate. 50 or 75 basis points in September is reasonable. It looks to me, uh, depending on what we see over uh, the next, um, next couple of months, we have two CPI reads, one PCE read, and a jobs report left to go. Uh, we have CPI and PPI this week. And if CPI comes in hot, well, 75 basis points is probably going to be the number. Unless there is a, uh, what is said over here, a meaningful reduction, uh, then uh, 75 basis points is on the table. If there's a meaningful reduction, it is still not consistent or lasting, 50 basis points will, still, will, will uh, probably be the move. Uh, but based on what these uh, five have been saying, uh, 
they are basically saying the market has it wrong. Uh, the cost of capital is going higher than what you think it's going to go, and it's going to stay higher for longer, which means cash flows, uh, future cash flows are being priced too high. Let's have a look at the jobs report. And uh, during the week, there was some uh, more discussion. I shouldn't say some more discussion about the trying to figure out, well, how did 528,000 jobs get added? It didn't seem like that. That, that doesn't seem right. Some people are pointing to the household uh, survey saying, well, the household survey disagrees. Uh, so let's go with that. Uh, the household survey and the establishment survey make up two parts of the jobs report. There's one side that is conducted by one organization and the other side is conducted by another. One is the Census Bureau, one is the Bureau of Labor Services. Um, let's look at the household data. When they ask questions, there is an age range. You know, are you below a certain age or above a certain age? If you are, these questions don't apply to you at all. Also, are you employed? The answer is yes or no. It doesn't say, are you employed twice or are you employed three times? Are you employed? Yes or no. For the establishment data, uh, did you create a job? Yes. There is no question about the age range. So if it is outside the age range of the household data, the establishment data will pick it up. Yes, we hired somebody. Well, you could have hired a 70-year-old. Uh, also, company A could say, yes, we hired somebody. Company B could say, yes, we hired somebody. However, they could be the same person. Now, the household data and the establishment data used to have a, a very close association. They weren't off by much. They tended to move in the same directions. But since the uh, pandemic, they tended to move apart. So, you know, there is a uh, significant amount of people who still work from home. So I ask myself, is it possible that somebody working from home just has two jobs? So they uh, take, uh, I know this is happening in the IT sector. I know it is, uh, where uh, an individual works full-time for this company, but they also take a full-time job from another company. Uh, and then over the course of the day, they work on both sites, work a little bit on this, work a little bit on that. So they're giving both company part-time hours, but they're getting full-time pay because you can't see them. You don't know what they're doing. And if you say, well, you know, what, what did you do today? Well, I had a bit of a problem. I had to think this through. I had to think that through. Well, that's normal in IT. You don't know. It's like a lawyer's bill. I did 16 hours this week. Well, you don't know. You have no idea if that's true or not. You just sort of have to accept it. So I wonder if there's any of that going on. Because it seems that they split apart after the pandemic. So you need some kind of theory as to, well, what is different about that environment versus the pre-pandemic environment that would explain some of that. The other explanation could be that, well, some people are coming out of retirement because inflation is so high and they're getting a job, whereas they wouldn't be counted in the household survey, they are counted in the establishment survey. Uh, another uh, 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 reason could be because inflation is so high, some people have had to take on a second job, but that doesn't count in the household survey, but would count in the establishment survey. In the end, it's only the establishment survey that matters in a very particular way, and I'll show you. And it's only the household survey that matters in a particular way. And that is with the participation rate. Uh, it dropped again. If you go back to May, 62.3 to 62.2 to 62.1. This is not a cyclical or an environmental or contextual issue. This is a structural problem uh, with the population right now. You have more people retiring uh, per month than you have entering the labor force. And that includes retirees who previously retired who are re-entering. It's just the size of the baby boomer cohort that are hitting retirement from 2010 to 2030 is larger than the incoming generation. Uh, so it is just a structural problem. It is also one of the wealthiest generations. So as they leave the workforce... Many of them, many of them don't need to come back in. Uh, so you don't have them extending uh, a retirement um, to, to an extent that you may otherwise have. Uh, well, that's a structural problem that you can't solve with any interest rate because you cannot manufacture working age people. You can manufacture babies, but you can't manufacture working age people. You can only do that with immigration. I don't see that happening over the next two years, especially with the midterm elections coming up and the Republicans more than likely uh, splitting, uh, uh, not splitting, but pretty much taking Congress, uh, maybe even the Senate. 
so I don't uh, and splitting power I don't see I don't see any real movement on immigration uh, there are some countries that are more immigration friendly, but there's two types of immigration. There's skills-based and there's familial. So Canada is uh, pro-immigration, but most of our immigration is familial, meaning that family members are coming over. Typically, the parents and grandparents are coming over. They're not uh, increasing, the, they're increasing the population, but not increasing the labor force size. So that type of immigration, that policy, even though it's well-meaning, is not going to fix that particular structural problem. You need to say, look, you know, we either have to increase our immigration and make it only the increase only skills-based, or if we're going to allow 500,000 uh, uh, people in, we have to switch from familial to skills-based if we want to solve this problem. Big political issues to solve. I don't see that uh, working out very well. So I see this continuing to slide, which creates a supply constraint in labor. And whenever you have a supply constraint, you have inflationary pressure. And that's what we're seeing with wages. I don't expect that to abate at all, which means these, I, this idea that inflation can magically drop to 2.6% by the end of next year without considering how you're going to solve uh, the wage constraint problem I think is fantasy. Let's uh, go down to the establishment survey and look at the only thing that matters there. So you have 528,000 jobs added. Now, let's say that wages were stagnant and maybe even dropping uh, and that unions were losing power and uh, $35 an hour uh, employees were being replaced by $17 an hour employees. Uh, well, then wage gains don't tell us very much because it doesn't tell us about the aggregate, aggregate amount of money that consumers have to go and spend with. Oh, more people have jobs, but if they're all working fewer hours per week and getting paid less per hour, well, that doesn't matter. So these numbers up here are not as important as these numbers down here. Let's look at hours and earnings to all employees, total private here. Average weekly hours. Now, this is just an average uh, that's still not very helpful. Same with average hourly earnings, 32.27. If you have 10 people making that and you have 20 people making that, clearly 20 people making the average is better than 10 people making the average. So the average doesn't tell me enough. I need an aggregate number. And there's where you get down to the indexes, aggregate weekly hours. And the big one here, index of aggregate weekly payrolls. This is an aggregate over the month percent change, 0.9. That means in July, there was 0.9% more earnings earned by employees to be spent than there was over the month of June. If you annualize that 0.9, it's like 11.5% on an annualized basis. So I can, I can uh, beat inflation in two ways as an employee. I can get a raise of 5%. Let's say inflation is 9%. I can get a 5% raise and I can work 5% more hours. That's a 10.25% aggregate boost to my weekly income. 10.5%. So that's why the aggregates matter. It's the aggregates of all payrolls, which will include not only the average per hour, but also the amount of hours worked as well. 0.9, that's 11.5% annualized more money to be spent than there was the month before. Now, ask yourself, will that increase or decrease inflationary pressure in goods and services? With a participation rate dropping, will that increase or decrease wage inflationary pressure? And when you answer those two questions, I think you can see that it's pretty clear that if, if there's 11.25% more money to be spent on an annualized basis, that's certainly not going to help reduce inflationary pressure. And if the participation rate is dropping, that's certainly not going to help reduce wage pressure. And if you can't reduce wage pressure, you can't reduce price pressure because all companies must pay those higher wages and they'll pass them through in higher prices, which will lead to higher wages, which will lead to higher prices, which is exactly what the Fed does not want. You can't reduce, the Fed can't just reduce inflation. It must get inflation completely out of the system together all together it must get it out of the system so um, this idea that 
we're going to get to three and a half by the end of the year and second quarter we're going to start cutting rates next year is to use the language of the market these days wishful thinking by a long shot this is the only thing that matters this 0.9 percent over here in terms of helping or hurting inflation and this is the only number that matters up here the participation rate in terms of hurting or helping wage inflation and the worse you do on wage inflation feeds down to price inflation as well here's the diffusion indexes anything over 50 is growth uh, 67 6 69 3 68 6 so since uh, what is this since May uh, it is higher since May it's dropped since June but higher since May if you just look at manufacturing which is huge for the Biden administration because they got the backing of unions the unions love to see this 66 uh, 65 5 dropped to 61 5 all the way up to 66 9 these are way above the 50 mark and it tells you uh, down here the notes down here tell you how to read this uh, it says here uh, 50 uh, uh, figures uh, are the percent of industries with employment increasing plus one half of the industries with unchanged employment that's how you calculate the diffusion index where 50 percent indicates an equal balance between industries with increasing and decreasing employment you're pushing 70. so there uh, on on this index so there is wage hiring uh, uh, growth going forward there is wage uh, growth in terms of what are being paid per hour going forward which means aggregate incomes will only increase you got to get those numbers down if you want to reduce inflationary pressure which means if we go back to the screen where the uh, fed speakers uh, were saying we are nowhere near done they are nowhere near done okay time to bring you back to level one macroeconomics understanding business cycles remember this exhibit from that particular reading phases of the business cycle let's look at the slowdown phase because if we look at pmi data pmi is suggesting we are in the slowdown phase how can we be in the slowdown phase with everything that we've seen look at the characteristics Businesses continue hiring, but at a slower pace. Unemployment rate continues to fall. We went from 3.6%. This last report showed that we are at 3.5%. Did that happen? Yes. Incomes are still growing. 0.9% for aggregate uh, total aggregate incomes. Are we still growing? Yes, we are. Are businesses continuing to hire? Yes, we, yes they are. Is spending above average? This is consumer durables. We will look at uh, the... Um, the weakened earnings we're going to look at the growth or, or how much consumer discretionary beat expectation if we're going to see yeah spending is above average and this is this is consistent for consumer discretionary even into a slowdown the spending will be above average what about services spending above average so in the slowdown we should see earnings doing quite well we should see job gains unemployment falling and incomes rising in the slowdown uh, since the market anticipates the uh, recession the market will start to drop however incomes are rising employment rate is dropping spending is above average ah earnings bear market rally oh no hang on next quarter ah bear market rally no hang on we're gonna go down ah bear market rally ah, let's go down it's because we're reading these wrong all of these all of these are consistent with a slowdown okay august 5th let's have a look at uh, our uh, week in earnings and uh, look at that this is the uh, share weighted earnings uh, um, the earnings outlook and earnings revisions for q2 this is only for q2 we're going to see that uh, the forward uh, revisions not so good uh, but as companies are reporting earnings look at what's going on hey they're beating expectations why go back to the last screen in a slowdown consumer spending on durable goods above average consumer spending on services above average incomes are still growing job gains are still happening they'll spend every penny they make the marginal propensity to consume is like 95 percent so the, if you give them more they'll spend more it's going to show up in earnings so it's not surprising that over the quarter this is what you've seen because we are in the slowdown earnings are still growing into the slowdown which can create that dichotomy between markets looking forward to the recession yet earnings still reflecting growth 
and you get these rallies during these earnings seasons that say, hang on a second, maybe we were premature. Companies are handling this, and it's always being consistent with a slowdown. Um, this is earnings versus expectations. Uh, what is the uh, best performing sector in here? Uh, it shouldn't surprise you. It's energy, right? Take energy out. Do you see something surprising? What's the best performing sector when you take energy out? The one you would think, how does that make any sense, right? Consumer discretionary, 9.3%. Again, go back to the previous screen. Spending on consumer durables, autos, motorcycles, appliances, furniture, above average, 9.3%. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, forward uh, earnings expectations here. And that is uh, down here, 234.05, lower uh, than it was last week, which was lower than it was the week before. So this, the forward four quarter EPS is coming down. We do have some companies reporting this week. Uh, not many, uh, not many companies reporting. I think the big one is on uh, on um, Wednesday uh, with Disney reporting. There's very few left to report. This is the last week of any kind of significant uh, earnings, and you have Disney uh, coming up on Wednesday. Beyond that, there's nothing. I don't expect too much uh, movement from earnings. That story is pretty much over. Uh, what is going to dominate uh, over the week is uh, also on Wednesday, uh, we'll see with the economic calendar, we have the CPI read coming out. Depending on what that is, the only conversation uh, till September really is the Fed. So let's look at our forward EPS. On July 15th, it was 239.98. July 22nd, 239.37, which was down 0.25%. July 29th dropped to 236.83, so that is down 1.06%. And as of August 5th, we're at 234.05, down 1.17%. Notice the magnitude is getting, uh, is getting larger. So we'll see if there's any revisions next week and if they're more than 1.17. Kind of hard, uh, I, I think, to get much lower than this at this point because most of the companies have reported. I don't know that earnings season can add any more upside to the market. Uh, so uh, in market action, as I said on the previous screen, from here until uh, the next Fed meeting is going to be dictated by economic report to economic report to economic report. Uh, and the narrative, whatever the narrative happens to be. But I think this narrative of Fed pivot, the Fed is going to pivot. I think that narrative uh, took a good bullet in the chest last week, and especially on Saturday uh, with, uh, uh, with Bowman saying 75 basis points till it's over. Never mind 75 on the table, 75 as a go at every meeting until it's done. Uh, so that should do something to dent that narrative. If it doesn't dent that narrative, well, I don't know what else can. Uh, you know, it's a, it is it has been a very strong narrative. If we look at the rally from the bottom uh, to where we are now, uh, the S and P has rallied 12.63 percent uh, from the lows uh, down here. Uh, of this 12.63 percent, 40 and a half percent of this amount came just from the Fed decision alone. Uh, so, what was the the idea that there's going to be a Fed pivot has been undone? this rally should be undone as well. Uh, or at least 40% of that rally, I think, should be undone based on uh, what was said. And the idea of higher for longer, that's not priced into the cost of capital. And if that's not priced into the cost of capital, the present value of all these cash flows is still too high. So where are we right now? Uh, 41, 45, 19 on the index. We're going to use the 234.05 as our earnings. We're at 17.7 times earnings uh, on the index. Uh, the low down here is 15.67. If we use the 234, that if we went back down to the lows, we would be at 15.67. This is in and around the 10-year average, neither too high nor too low. But I have suggested that the 10-year average might be um, a little biased to the upside only because from 2009, 2010, all the way to, to now, you've had um, 
never seen before increases in the balance, steady increases in the Fed balance sheet with super, super low rates globally. That's all being undone and unwound now. Uh, all of that. And it was during that period of time that corporate earnings as a share of GDP, that is earnings as a share of GDP, uh, was running around 12%. The long-term mean reverting level is 6%. This was at 12%. Uh, and during this period of time, uh, we saw that uh, the majority of gains were uh, of income of gains uh, uh, in the economy were going uh, towards earnings as opposed to wages. Well, that's being changed right now. So I don't know that you're going to be able to keep this 12%. I don't know if comparing yourself with the 10 year average is uh, is going to be suitable. But uh, here's where we are, and we have to play the market where we are, and individuals anchor, and then they adjust. So they will anchor to the 10-year multiple, the 10-year forward. And if people make decisions based on where they've anchored and adjusted from, they will make decisions based on that multiple, not some multiple that existed prior to that time. So we got to work with that. So earlier, I said the 15.67 if we revisited the lows, the 15.67 would be a multiple of the forward earnings. Well, what if we kept the same multiple? If we're going to anchor and adjust from the multiple and we kept the same multiple and we revisited the lows, what does that apply, uh, imply about what the level of EPS would be? Uh, 20704, which means that's 11.53% below where we are right now. So a forward expectations drop. 11.5% from where we are now, and we keep the same multiple, we could revisit the lows. Or if we keep the same earnings and the forward multiple simply just drops, you could revisit the lows. I don't see this as very likely. I think if earnings uh, hold tight or the expectation holds tight, I see no reason why there would be a multiple contraction. Uh, typically, you get both happening at the same time that if this starts dropping significantly, this would drop by about the same, uh, the same amount as well. So let's say that uh, this goes from 17.7 down to 17 because the 234 went down to 230, which would not be unrealistic. You're 39.10, which is basically where you were before uh, the train wreck of a press conference. That is a drop of 5.66% from where we are. Still nowhere near the lows of, uh, you know, mid 3600s, I think 3665, getting back down to 3910, I think would be the first retracement target that I would look at uh, and, uh, you know, go from there. Wednesday's CPI will tell us a lot. I think if there's going to be a sharp move down, it'll be on, on uh, the CPI number. If it, come, if it doesn't fall enough, um, the headline is expected to drop from 9.1 only because energy prices have come down. The headline is expected, expected to drop. Uh, but the core is expected to rise. Which one will the market pay attention to? What will the narrative be going into that? That's going to be what matters. But even if there is uh, a sell-off, uh, I think that 39, uh, 3900 would be our first support level there. Because I do think that this uh, must now come out of the market. Because what was priced in there, the Fed pivot uh, and uh, a max of 3.5% with early cuts in 2023, that's gone. So if that got priced in, that's got to get priced out. Let's look, at, uh, let's look at our week ahead. Okay, we're just looking at the U.S. here. By the way, I, I always lean towards the U.S. market because it is a good template to use. Um, if you're wondering, well, what about the U.K. market or the Indian market or the Australian market? You follow the same process. You would just have to look up your own data. I can't uh, possibly do a, a, a you know a, a video for every single country, but every country is is got its own drivers of what's going on. But you would follow the same template. Nothing much happening on Monday. Tuesday uh, at uh, 8.30, we have non-farm productivity and unit labor costs. This is uh, quarter over quarter uh, for Q2. Most of this information we already have, but it is worth looking at what unit labor costs uh, are going to be. Let's go down into uh, Wednesday morning mortgage applications ending the 5th of August. I do expect those to come in positive only because rates just kept dropping uh, throughout this period. Here's the big one. 
uh, inflation. You have year over year uh, for core. Notice uh, the expectation is for 6.1 up from 5.9, but uh, for headline 9.1 down to 8.7. Which one will fuel the narrative? I don't know. The market these days seems to look for any shred of good news in anything to grab a hold of and then it just talks about that and inflates that and tends to ignore everything else such as the power that we have in that narrative today. This is where the focus will be uh, month over month because this gets annualized. Uh, this is uh, 0.5 down from 0.7 annualized to 6.1% on core. Still way too high. The inflation rate month over month, 0.2. That, that is going to be the market mover. 0.2, this is headline now. Uh, and I don't think the Fed really cares how you get to 2% as long as headline is 2%. 0.2 annualized is 2.4%. Um, that would fuel a rally. That you can, you can look for another 100 points on, 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 the, on the index just from that alone. Uh, from wherever point you are because nothing else will matter anymore that will be the only thing and the fed pivot will be back on the table the fed's going to pivot the fed's going to pivot even though they said that they need to see it over a prolonged period of time over several months that one point is not going to do it the fed pivot will be in full play uh, so this number right here uh, if there's going to be a rally, it's going to come on this coming in at 0.2 because annualized is 2.4 and that's headline. Core will be ignored uh, at that point. But if this comes in hotter, I mean, you know, you got to think you're going from 1.3 month over month all the way down to 0.2 month over month. Uh, is, that, is that a doable number? Or is that just a lot of uh, wishful thinking in that forecast giving way... Uh, too much weight just to the price of gasoline uh, coming down over that period of time. Um, wages have still gone up over that period of time. And the U.S. is probably the most energy efficient in, in as far as per dollar of GDP. Uh, so that a drop in energy might not get it there. I don't know. I think that that is a huge drop down. But that will be the number. Nobody knows. I mean... Who knows? Uh, you can sometimes you can flip a coin, but my 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 intuition would lean towards coming in uh, more than a point two, especially since we were at one point three last period, and core at point five. Maybe it'll be a little bit uh, uh, higher than point five based on what PCE was last month in terms of its annualized rate. One point one, sorry, uh, yeah, one point one. You annualize that. Or, no, sorry, it was 1%. Annualized that is over 12%. This uh, 0.5 annualized to 6.1. Nothing much exciting happening. Uh, Thursday, you have PPI. PPI is not such a big mover, uh, but you have that on uh, Thursday. And then you have uh, on uh, Friday, uh, consumer sentiment uh, with the inflation expectations being a big deal uh, for the Fed. Well, these days, it's hard to know what's a big deal for the Fed. They used to have... A couple of things that they looked at because they had two mandates. Lately, I don't know how many mandates they have, so I don't even know what they watch anymore. It just it gets so confusing trying to follow uh, uh, what uh, what Powell is doing from week to week uh, or meeting to meeting. He keeps bringing up new indicators. We're looking at this. We're looking at this. Here's some social issues that we care about. It's okay. Well, uh, kind of hard to read. You have one job right now, only one job, and that's inflation. Try to focus. Anyways, that, uh, that is the week. There's one screen left, and uh, we're done. Okay, I'm on uh, our site. If uh, Depending on how wide you make your screen, you might not see all the titles here. Click on here. Click on Applied Series uh, Bundle, and you'll get this. It's 220 uh, USD right now. All our prices as of uh, April, uh, August 3rd, have switched to US because, of course, we're owned by a US company now, Serify. If you scroll down, uh, it'll give you uh, a schedule as to the price increases in the uh, Applied Series Bundle. Subscriptions up to September 15th are 220 After that, they increase to $320. Uh, beginning March 1st next year, they increase to, they'll increase uh, as more and more content is added. 
but if you buy at uh, 220 uh, no further fees uh, uh, would be required as content is added you get all six modules the modules are listed across the top there's the applied options course which is currently done but will be updated uh, over the next couple of years because uh, the subscription uh, lasted to December 2024 for any new content that's added uh, you get it all the way to 2024 after 2020 after that date you still have access to everything uh, that you bought you just don't get any newer content that continues to be added uh, so there are six sectors altogether or six modules the applied options course the sector studies uh, are starting um, next week uh, so uh, they are consumer discretionary materials, real estate, financials, consumer staples, information technology. This will expand to cover all 11 sectors over time, but uh, these first six sectors will be presented. Each of these videos are s s as short as little under two hours to little over three hours, and it leads you through the whole sector, uh, uh, and especially the economic drivers of the sector. Uh, and what drives the, the uh, at the next level, the industry groups, the broad industry groups at those, uh, at those sectors. Uh, but this won't be completed till uh, mid-October sometime, but as a standalone option, as a standalone module, it will not be available till October 31st. Starting October 31st, you can buy it just as its standalone module. Then there's applied macro and top-down analysis applied bottom-up analysis, applied futures, and options on futures, and applied Forex. Contrary to what uh, uh, most people think when uh, we're talking about macro investing or macro trading, uh, it is not macroeconomics. That is just one little part of macro trading. Macro trading is about broad themes that are global. Uh, big, big themes, uh, currencies, commodities, uh, particular countries' equity markets, uh, emerging over developed markets. It's big, broad themes like that. That is macro. Macro means investing at the level of the top as opposed to stock picking. You're investing in big themes that span uh, multiple markets. Yes, you use economics to do that as well, but you're also looking for big themes. So uh, the electrification of the automobile. Well, that's a big theme uh, that affects multiple industries across multiple countries. So that is uh, uh, would be called a macro trend and looking at big themes like that and finding ETFs that track an entire theme, uh, that is macro, uh, macro investing. So this is macro and then uh, that's when you do macro, you are at the same time doing a top-down analysis because you identify a big theme. Well, which industry that encompasses that big theme would be the one that would be uh, uh, expected to outperform? Then you have bottom-up. This is from uh, the level of the stock upwards. If you are going top-down, you will get to a peer group. You're going to have to have some way to say, okay, well, let's jump now to the uh, individual stocks and work our way back up. Then you have futures and options on futures and Forex. This is into the future. When you buy the um, uh, applied uh, series bundle, you get all of these as they're introduced. But as they're introduced, this price does increase uh, over time. Uh, the individual uh, components, if you buy them all individually, I think are somewhere around 1200 and change whereas the bundle itself if you buy them all as the bundle they max out at uh, at 650 so there we are